Okay, so we're up to episode three, and this one is titled Squeeze, and for some reason, this is the one that's that lasted longest in my memory. Um, I could remember most of this one, and I really enjoyed revisiting it. You're the X-Files man, so I take it, is, is this a standout episode for the fans, or is it just a, a regular one that's forgotten about? This is definitely an X-Files classic. If, if, you're, if you're a diehard X-Files fan... Someone asks you to name a few episodes from season one. Squeeze is going to be one of them. Uh, if you, I'd imagine it's in most X Files fans' top five from season one. It's certainly in mine. So, <laughs> but um, it kind of starts off this a monster of the week type thing that happens every now and again in the the X Files as well, where it's not so much aliens as something that's just unexpected. So we say. So the episode opens with a man just leaving a building, he's, he's walking across like a, a sort of city centre and then the camera starts to focus on a sewer and really just starts to you know, focus in on it even more and more until you see a set of eyes. And what I noticed most about this, just for this starting scene, was how it was very horror-centric. Uh, I'm a great horror fan and that even the music, the way it just sort of lingered on that dark space before pushing into it, you know, straight away I was like, yeah, I, I'm in on this one. Can't wait to just move further on in it, but it's just a great setup. Yeah, that shot reminds me a little bit of Pennywise from It, Stephen King's It. Just the way mm-hmm. the way he looks out of the sewer grid, it kind of feels a, a little bit like that. But yeah, it, instantly we set up this intriguing, as you say, monster of the week. Um, what, what's this guy doing down the sewers, and what? Is he doing with yellow eyes? What's that all about? It's clearly mm. not human. And yeah, I mean, we had two episodes of alien slash government conspiracy, so it felt like you know that that was the show. That's that's what it's going to be. That's what it's always going to be. But then all of a sudden, the tone of the series completely shifts gear, and we're into we're not into aliens. We're not into government conspiracies. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this episode kind of it, it 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 sets the bar for for what kind of X Files fan you're going to be. Whether you like this episode more or whether you're going to be drawn more into that mythology arc kind of episode. Yeah. Um, so I think some people are more inclined to to go with the Monster of the Week episodes, and I think one of the reasons for that is that. It, these episodes allow you to dip in and out of the series and not have to kind of get caught up with the long running storyline that mm-hmm. that will get quite convoluted as the series goes on. Yeah, like you say, I, I'm definitely a Monster of the Week fan. I, I like this type of episode, and although I do like the overarching story, it's nice to have a, a little break from that as well. You know, just to to refresh everything before you go back into that, like you said, convoluted storyline. Definitely, yeah, but. But I could see this episode as a whole, I could see this as a movie. I could see somebody expanding this and taking away, you know, the, 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 the modern Scully characters, replacing them with two other detectives. This could be a movie of its, its own. And it's just a, a really good story. So, Yeah, I mean, th- this is an episode that does get a sequel. I think I mentioned that last week. Basically, they do, yeah, they do another episode in which Tombs returns. And... When these episodes were first released over here in the UK, they were released as a movie. So they edited out the the end titles of the first episode and the opening titles of the second episode, stuck them together, and and it it worked. It kind of worked as as a feature film. So yeah, it, it, I think I think that was really the kickoff point for for people thinking that actually the X-Files would work on the big screen. It, it, it was a series that, from that point on, certainly from Tombs, um, the fans thought, you know what, this has got potential to go to the big screen. Right. So is the sequel episode is it in the first season as well? It is, yeah. It's, it's towards the end of the uh, first season. Oh, great. I can't really remember too much about that. Um, so after you've got this opening scene, you've got the, the titles, and then you move on to Scully meeting an old friend for lunch, and this guy just is pretty sleazy and you know all about the career and demeaning of Mulder. He's a full-on douchebag, isn't he? He's a oh, full-on yeah. douchebag. 
But I, yeah. I, I love this actor. I think he's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, he's been in so many things where, yep. um, e even terrible things, where he's stolen the show. Um, mm -hmm. He was in Ghost Rider. He played uh, Nick Cage's best friend in Ghost Rider. Right. And he was the guy in the first Blade film that Blade kept on yeah. naming. And <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I really love this guy. He's been in a lot. He's currently in Gotham, actually, as Harvey Bullock. Right. Uh, so, but he looks w proper different here. Really young, mm -hmm. kind of wet behind yeah. the ears. Um, so this guy is looking... He seems very sleazy, he seems very duplicitous, he's all about the career and his career path. He seems like the complete counterpoint to Mulder's character, and I think that's what Scully sees in this, you know, like Mulder is extremely focused, yes, but he's focused on these cases, he's focused on uh, his job at hand. This guy seems to be more focused on just moving up the ladder and getting the prestige of the next job. But it's him that actually brings the, the case to Scully. Yeah, absolutely. He's very eager, I think, to to mock Mulder. Like he, he caught you know, he calls him spooky Mulder. He mm -hmm. he's very demeaning of Scully's work actually. He yep. I, I think he expects her to return the the slagging off, so to speak, to say, Yeah, yeah, I'm working with this weirdo. Oh, please get me the hell out of here. But the surprise mm -hmm. is that She's actually not like that, and he is an old friend of hers, so it seems. They seem very friendly together at the beginning, mm -hmm. but actually she has developed enough respect already for Mulder to not want to join in with that kind of talk, um, and it says a lot about Scully's character as well. Um, I mean, she, mm -hmm. might, she might even think those things. She might agree that, yeah, actually there is something off about Mulder, but y y she, you gain respect for her because she doesn't join in with that kind of talk there is a slight reaction from her face when he when he says that you won't have to be miss spooky anymore mm -hmm. we get like a bit of a close-up on her face and it's one of those reactions where you can kind of read it both ways uh, that she doesn't like being called that by him and maybe that's the turning point for her viewpoint towards him or that actually she agrees and that yeah you know what getting to be reassigned would would be quite a good thing right mm -hmm. about now um so certainly from the perspective of co coming into this episode from the beginning it, it can mm -hmm. it can be read kind of both ways i think when you first watch it you can think actually yeah, get me out of here. But by the, by the time we get to the end of the episode, that viewpoint kind of changes. Yeah, there's also a third point as well in that one, Brian, where she didn't realise that she's been regarded as Mrs Spooky as well, and she's probably seen the fickle nature of the people round about her who are so quick to lambast and just title people, you know, give them this kind of title as well. And she probably doesn't want to be associated with, with those kind of peoples. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because so far she's only seen it against Mulder. Um, in the past mm -hmm. two episodes she has she has heard people refer to him as Spooky Mulder and that, and she even calls that out in the first episode before she meets mm -hmm. him. It, like, if you go back to that first episode when she calls it out to her bosses, um, you know, they, they ask her, what, what, do you th what do you think? And she says, you know, I've heard, you know, the nickname yeah. Spooky, and she, she gives this kind of wry little smile. It's okay to, to kind of joke about things like that when you don't know the person. And here, mm -hmm. a couple of episodes after, she knows the guy. And now that that doesn't sit too well with her. So I, I like that they I like that they show that in such a short space of time. The actual crime scene where uh, Mulder and Scully are, are looking at the man who's been murdered. And Mulder is introduced to, shall we just call him douchebag FBI guy? Colton, yeah. Um, yeah, Colton, that's the guy. <laughs> Tom Colton. But I, I'm fine with douchebag FBI guy. That sits quite well. And then um, I noticed straight away that, you know, the guy's dismissive of Mulder straight away. And rather than be getting defensive or argumentative, Mulder just plays right into it and starts coming out with this <laughs> load of nonsense, you know, and just makes no attempt to, like, Say at the end, you know, this is a joke, just purely, like, you know, like, he just cultivates, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the mythos of Spooky Mulder. I it's, thought it was a great scene. Yeah, it's, it's that line when he says, uh, do you have any idea what liver and onions go for in the reticulum galaxy? <laughs> and you you, you, yeah. you watch it and you're like, is he being serious? It's like the first time you watch this, you're like, 
I actually don't know if he's being serious or whether he's just trying to shine him on. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, it becomes very evident pretty quickly that he is just he's just pulling one over on him basically. But it, it, oh, it's yeah. just this this idea that actually Mulder doesn't care. He couldn't mm-hmm. give a toss about this stuff, and if people are too close-minded to to show respect for the fact that he does believe in certain things, then he just doesn't mm-hmm. care. He doesn't have the time for them, and he's he's, he's not going to try and win them over. He's like you say, he's the complete contrast to Tom Colton. Colton cares about climbing the ladder, therefore he cares about what people think of him. And Mulder is just the complete opposite of that. And also in this scene, it's crucial as in he finds the the fingerprint on the air vent as well, which will lead to, until later in the actual story. But it's the only, the only reason they find that is because Mulder's willingness to look for every possibility, regardless regardless of how it's going to seem, you know, that it's probably been missed because people have looked at that and thought, no way somebody's come in through that. Mulder thought, well, why not just give it a try? Yeah, well, why would you Why would you fingerprint an air vent that is, you know, high up in the room, no one's coming through it, they're not certainly not going to leave through it. So, yeah, Mulder sees that and he thinks, you know what, let's just fingerprint it. And Colton calls him out. He's like, uh, you know, he, he talks about the measurements of the vent instantly mm-hmm. and tells you this ain't a thing that... that they're even going to be looking at. They're not even going to be considering it. But that's that's the crux of the episode, isn't it? That's where the the fear factor comes in. Is that actually mm-hmm. this guy Tombs? He's your worst nightmare because he can get into any spot. He can get out of any spot um, if mm-hmm. if there's even the slightest gap. He can just stretch through it. And it's. I mean, we'll get back to that towards the end of the episode with Mulder's last lines of dialogues. But that's essentially what this episode plays on it plays on those fears yeah. after this scene we move into um, Mulder actually digging through his files and connecting this to an Excel that he's got 30 years apart it's kind of still part of that scene with Coulson um, but mm-hmm. they've they've kind of they've gone off to one side and Mulder talks about this this previous X-Files case so he essentially says look we're well within our rights to investigate this under our own steam. Scully's a bit nervous about that, mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. Mulder's kind of like, you know, they can have their investigation, we'll have ours, and never the twain shall meet. So as far as yeah. he's concerned, you know, let's, let's keep this on the down low kind of thing, but that's mm-hmm. going to be pretty hard to do, obviously, as the, as the uh, episode goes on. So in the next scene, we've got Scully profiling the murderer, you know, and she's sort of rationalising everything that's, that's happened and then she's sort of given her presentation to a group of sort of higher up FBI agents who seem to revel in mocking Mulder. Yeah, they they not only mock Mulder in this, uh, I mean, this, this is her bosses, this is Mulder's bosses, it's Colson's bosses and they're willing to mock Mulder in, in front of everyone. Um, so not only is that the height of unprofessionalism, but it's, it's just, it, it's not very good for Scully. It's degrading of her. Um, it's it says something I think about their reaction to women as well in the FBI because she's the only woman in the room, but she's also the smartest person in the room. She's the one who makes the connection that finds tombs. She's the one who, through profiling this guy, says that there's a there's a good chance he's going to return to the scene of the crime to relive the emotional high um so in in one kind of fell swoop she proves herself to be the most vital asset on the case they find tombs because of her not because of colson but they're, they're, they're ever so nice to throw her a bone and go like you know what why don't you come and work with some uh, real fbi agents for a little while we'll give you a little bit of overtime mm. you know and it's just such a, a throwaway sort of demeaning sort of comment because like you say she's the smartest person in the room yeah and then after that we move on to the stakeout where um scully seems to be the only fbi agent that we see staking the place out she's in a, a Sort of garage under a building, I'm assuming, and she just happens to bump, bump into Mulder. Yeah, <laughs> which I cannot, for the life of me, figure out why he's there. Well, he he he, he calls it out. He goes there to tell her that she's wasting her time, and this is the thing. She she's actually smarter than Mulder in this case, um, because Mulder doesn't buy her profile. He doesn't think that he will return to the scene of the crime. So he goes there to say, look, stop wasting your time here. Let's let's go and 
you know, take a different angle on it. And then, and then obviously it's as she goes back to the car after he's had that little chat with her, he actually comes across Tombs um, and is proven wrong by by Scully. So literally, uh, you know, as I say, Scully's the she's the Clarice Starling in this episode. She's the smartest one in the room, even even over Mulder at this point. And Mulder is known for his serial killer profiling. It's it's one of it's one of the things he became famous for. Um, there was a a reference in the first episode about him catching this guy called Monty Props and it was because of his serial killer profiling. But also when you get to see Tombs for the first time as well, he's a very slight, small person. Not the type of guy that could overpower the six foot two guy that they mention. Mm. In the first murder that we see, he's he's odd looking as well. Yeah. He, he looks <laughs> extremely <laughs> suspicious. And he has like a all through the episode, you see he's got an extreme lack of facial expression, except from a couple of scenes later on whenever he's attacking someone like that. But just now when you see him, he's got no emotion whatsoever. He's extremely vacant, isn't he? It's just... Yeah, absolutely. It's like at once nothing, but at the same time everything going on behind his eyes. Yeah. Um, he's, yeah, there's just really something off about this guy, and it's perfect casting. Um, this This guy had never acted before um before this episode and uh he was a he was in a rock band apparently um and he came <laughs> <laughs> he came for the audition for this and he, he got it um just because of how he looked but he, he's actually a really good actor and i think you called it out in the the last episode or, or so at some point that this guy went on to do the green mile so he, he's in the green mile uh, he's unfortunately in batman and robin as well but um, <laughs> that was the low point of his career <laughs> so after that scene we go to Tombs interrogation and again he's extremely calm he, he answers the questions in a sort of monotone voice and he, he passes everything with the exception of these crazy questions that Mulder throws in much to the chagrin of all the other FBI agents yeah and it, it's just really establishing whether or not this guy was alive in 1933 uh, during the Powhatan Mill uh, case. Um, obviously, everyone gets really wigged out by that question. And the, the thing that kind of strikes me about this scene is as much as we're on Mulder's side, as much as we're on Scully's side, when the agent says, is this the Powhatan Mill question or is this the 1933 question? Because um, let me tell you, I got a reaction out of that question. You, you kind of understand it you, you know it's it, you, you can't help but think actually you know what I can understand why that guy would have that reaction I can understand why right now he's looking at Mulder like he's a whack job because yeah Mulder's literally just seemingly plucking this out of his out of his ass and and just running with it uh like I say, it's only because we know Mulder as the viewers, we, we we know from the past two episodes, yeah, he's generally right in this stuff, that we can kind of sympathise with his plight. But if we didn't know this guy, and if, if we only knew his reputation, and we worked in the FBI, then then yeah, throwing those questions in would get that reaction out of us, I think. But, but they've also got another nature as well, as they could rattle the guy, you know, let him know that they're on to him. You know, they're asking such strange questions. This is the, the, the government, this is the FBI, and they're asking such wacky questions. <laughs> they obviously know, you know, this information about them, which it, is, it does turn out to be completely true. Yeah. So there's, so there's a scene just after this. Uh, there's a quote from Mulder that I really love, because Scully's kind of like, you know, you're not doing yourself any favours, basically. And... <laughs> Mulder just says, sometimes the need to mess with their heads outweighs the millstone of humiliation. Uh, I, I just love that line. It's, it just sums Mulder up to a T. Uh, just like we were saying before, he just he just doesn't care and he'd rather get a rise out of people and, uh, and be humiliated. But so from there on, Mulder tells Scully to go with the other investigation team um, and that he wouldn't blame her if she did. Uh, and this is kind of a turning point in their relationship, um, I think, because she says, actually, you know, I think you've probably got something and I want to see what it is. So right then, Scully's made her choice. 
she at this point in the episode, this point in the series, she's made her choice. She's sticking with Mulder. She's abandoning Colton. Um, she doesn't really care about going down their line of inquiry. And I think, yeah, again, we respect her because of it. Um, this this scene also sets up something for later on in the episode because Mulder kind of he reaches out and touches her cross. It's this it's this weird little kind of affectionate moment, but it, it also kind of it gets us it gets our mind on that cross, which is going to be quite pivotal later on in the episode. Absolutely, and it comes to the uh, the, the fingerprint scene again. Which uh, I'm trying to put myself back in the mindset of when I saw this of what I thought was the possibilities of having this fingerprint elongated and, and thinned out, but I just can't think. I, once you know the answer, you can't you can't go back. But can you imagine what you thought the first time you seen that scene? Uh, well, I, I I thought exactly what Mulder thinks. Really, you know, it's, it's an elongated fingerprint. I'm watching a series about paranormal phenomena, so. This dude can stretch. You know, we, we've already seen that Mulder was dusting for prints in that air vent, this tight spot that, that Colton said no one can get through. Clearly this guy can, and he does it by stretching because of this fingerprint. It doesn't leave you long before it actually shows you it, because in the next scene it's got Tim stalking another guy, and he scales the building and you see it at the top of the chimney, this extremely small hole as he begins to work his way down it. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a scene that... I feel has dated a little in the special effects department. Um, it still looks all right. I I I still think it passes muster. Um, it doesn't you know throw me off. But I remember first seeing it uh, in nineteen ninety three and thinking, wow, look at the special effects on that for a t- for a TV show. That's <laughs> that's above and beyond for a TV show. But now it's just like okay, it it tells the story. It it you know it lets us know what's going on. I'm fine with it, um, but yeah, and and the the murder scene as well that takes place after that feels really tame by today's standards. I re- I remember how shocking it it seemed when I first watched it all those years ago, um, but you actually see nothing. You don't see a thing. You just see tombs coming up behind the guy. The music rises, and then in slow motion, he kind of just throws him on the floor. Um, we see a drop of blood spatter, but that that's it. And, yeah, I, I just think if they did that scene today, they, they'd probably show a lot more, a lot, lot more. Yeah, but it just shows that you don't necessarily have to have it. It doesn't... I don't think it would make the scene any any better, I don't think. it's, it's It just shows you attacking that's what happened move on to the next scene. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it either improves or, you know, demeans the scene so to speak I I just think that it's a commentary really on on societal, societal viewing habits I guess just uh, this, oh, this, this, absolutely. This, yeah this we live in a post hostile post saw world in which we have to see it um, you know you, you think about seven the film seven in which you don't really get to see anything it's all it's all what is kind of teased and and kind of planted in your imagination and then you jump ahead 10 years 10 or so years and then we get saw and it's like actually we don't suggest a thing we show you everything and and that's to me is the the worrying thing about television and film is that actually now we leave nothing to the imagination absolutely and i think we've seen so many times before that it's it's far better if you leave it up to the viewer's imagination because once you show them it's never going to be as worse as what you can imagine no that's right so after this attack it turns into a crime scene where scully actually aids Mulder and threatens her friend a douchebag fbi guy <laughs> Yeah, I, I again. I just, I just think this episode is a real high point for Scully. Um, Scully really shows her weight as a person throughout this episode, and there's there's a line there, an exchange between her and Douchebag Cop, in which Douchebag, you know, says, "Whose side are you on?" And she just says, "The victims." And I love that kind of, you know, he, he's got nothing for that. He, there is no comeback for that because. That's what they should all be there for. They should all be on the victim side. But he's too busy playing the career game, um, and and Mulder in many ways is too busy playing the 
kind of screw you to, to the whole FBI game. But but she pulls his string perfectly when she actually threatens his career. You know, it's the only thing he seems interested in and she just, you know, gives him a nudge that that could go away very quickly. Yeah, she, she knows exactly which strings to pull. So at the crime scene, Mulder notices that a trophy's been taken. Uh, so this this sets up the idea that actually if you can find the trophies, if you can find the things that were missing from the other crime scenes and you can f- and you can find them at Toombs's address, then you've got your evidence um, t- to a degree. Yeah, I think this is... Um, just after that, that's the scene where Mulder starts to explain Toombs' past or, or the suspected past. And the, the, the two... FBI agents Mulder and Scully start to research, uh, looking for patterns at these timescales, looking for birth certificates and things like that. And this is one of the scenes that I really like in the episode because, not because it does anything fancy, but because it shows you them actually spending the time to investigate something. And it's something missing from like modern TV shows and uh, movies where these they're doing the mundane job. He's sitting in front of this machine for hours. It must be boring, it must be tedious. And this is what police work is, you know, it's not all just like chat the door, I'll just give you all this exploratory evidence that you're going to need to move to the next scene, they actually have to work to find it. Yeah, if, if, you, if you look at like CSI these days, they'd send something off to the lab and then the next scene they'd have it and it's just like, where, where was that in-between point? Where was the bit where these guys actually had to do some work for themselves? They do the research and they find a cop that was alive the last time there was murders and they track him down to a home and they go and speak to this guy who has pretty much uh, an information dump. But <laughs> Battle exposition, anyway. <laughs> yeah, but because of the previous scene where we've seen them working, we're willing to forgive it in this scene because this guy has lived through it already. It, it, I, I, again, this is another thing with casting. I think they do a good job of casting right with this guy because cause he is just exposition. But because of the way he plays it, and because of the um, I don't know the the character of the of the actor that's playing them, you do get a sense of the history this guy has with the with the case, that it's lingered over him for thirty years, um, and that it's haunted him. Well, this this is the one issue I've got with the episode. This guy was supposed to be alive in the thirties as well, and a working policeman. So you've got to imagine that this guy's got to be in his mid eighties. But it doesn't look anywhere close to that age in this episode. Well, this was nineteen ninety three. Yeah, and I think that's where it could be the hang up for me. But even then, it's like the guy's supposed to be like mid eighties. You, you don't think he looks mid eighties? No, <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I think the guy looks he looks barely in his sixties, if anything. Oh, give me a break! My dad's in his sixties, and he doesn't look that old. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I, yeah, I'm I'm willing to let that one slide. I, I think if this guy was in his early twenties, when uh, yeah, he's just uh, th- th- but he he was investigating the sixties case. He wasn't investigating the thirties case. No, but they said he was a cop in the thirties. I'm sure they've mentioned it in the episode. No, 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 no. They they said because when the second case came around, he wasn't able to investigate anymore because they'd put him in a desk job. I th- I'm pretty sure that's what they said because I, I, that's what made me think. Wow, this guy's supposed to be like have been around for you know, two sets of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, three, three technically because he's well, well. The first one, the first one was in 1933, wasn't it? Um, yeah. That's that's when the first killing that. It was above Toombs' oh. apartment, um, so... Yeah, so, so if you take it, he was a, a cop then. <laughs> and the thing, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just... I'm not willing to comment right now because I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that that was the case. I, 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 yeah, I feel like... I feel like he was investigating the 60s cases, the, the 60, 63 yep. cases, but I don't feel like he was investigating the... Th- the, the case is from 1933. Yeah, I mean, if you're right, then minimum he would have had to have been in his 20s during 30, the 33 case to be, to be investigating oh. it. Um, let's say 25. Um, so 30 years from that, 55 for the... And then 
and then sixties. The so, yeah, so about eight, about eighty five. He'd have to be. Yeah, yeah I, I'm. I, I, I'll give you about. I'll give you seventy five. I'd say that guy looks looks like he could get away with playing seventy five. But yeah, maybe eighty five is a stretch. But <laughs> yeah, all right. Something to be investigated. I feel. Yeah, what a sidetrack. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good catch, though. It's a good catch. Yeah, but anyway, in this episode. The, well, or in that scene, the guy mentions the, the original address, the 66 Exeter Street, where the, the first killing took mm. place, which leads Mulder and Scully back to this abandoned building. Yeah. And what a dive this place is. My understanding as well is... Because cause Scully mentions that the apartment, or the, the address that Toombs gave... To the to the FBI when when they caught him on the stakeout was a front. So they say there's there's no yeah. one living there. Now I'm assuming that this was the same address and that they've gone there, found that nothing is there, and so just abandoned it. But it's only when Mulder and Scully go back there and go inside that they realise actually if somebody had just pushed that mattress down off the wall. They'd have found that hole. So I, I don't know if I don't know if this address, sixty six Exeter Street, is the same address that he gave to the FBI. Um, I, I'm not sure it even matters, but yeah, I, I took it uh, the other way that they, he gave like a, a another address where he'd never stayed, and they found this. But you're right; it could be seen that way as well. That somebody could have searched the apartment and found you know nothing. But yeah, they find that hole in the wall that leads them to. All kind of scary scenarios. In your typical horror movie, you're like, don't go down there. <laughs> Nothing's good's going to be down there. Stay away from that. And then you see Scully straight up. But you know, Mulder takes a step back, try to assess the situation. Scully straight in there going down the line. Yeah, Scully goes first. This is, uh, again, I, I think I said this um, in in the last episode where Scully kind of becomes known for being the one who kicks ass in a fight. And Mulder tends to be the one who gets his ass handed to him in a fight. Um, likewise, she's the first one to, uh, to to go down the hole. And it kind of re- reminds me of a quote that is coming in a in a later episode. Actually, um, I think the, the Jersey Devil. I think it is. Um, but I, I'll I'll leave that until we get there. So, um, but yeah, Scully goes first, and they. They find Toombs' nest and um so yeah, they find Toombs' nest and his trophies. Um Mulder gets bile on his fingers as he's kind of looking at the nest. Comes out with another corking one line about uh, <laughs> is there any way to get this off my fingers quickly without betraying my cool exterior? And it's just like it's yeah. Classic Mulder line. And, yeah, uh, like I say, this is the reason we had that scene before in which Mulder kind of touched on Scully's cross because Toombs, in the dark, it it seems like Scully's kind of caught on something um, Mm -hmm. momentarily and it turns out that actually it was Toombs and he has pulled the cross from her neck. He's taken it as a trophy, which tells us that... Scully is going to be his next victim. I couldn't really remember this scene a hundred percent, but when she gets snagged on something, she she says, says to Mulder, "Oh, hang on, I'm snagged," and she kind of looks down at her leg, and then she walks out of the scene, and the, you know, there's the hand dangling holding the, the necklace, and you're like, "How the how did how did he get that? How did he take that off her neck yeah. without her, you know, feeling it in some way, shape, or form?" Yeah, I I I just assume he snapped the uh, snapped it at the link and uh... spoken like a true jewellery thief, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, in my old pickpocketing days, you needed to know the uh, tricks of the trade. Then you've got the next part where Mulder set up a a stakeout and the uh, douchebag FBI guy cancels it just yeah for no flat reason. out just cancels it yeah, and as a result, puts Scully in danger. There's Again, there's a, we see more hostility towards Mulder uh, by the agents who come to the stakeout because uh, cause Mulder is, is on the stakeout to begin with. Those agents arrive. Um, one of them calls him spooky. Again, just, you know, just drilling that point home. These guys just really don't like him. 
Um, and then after that, obviously, we don't see him again because the stakeout has been called off by Douchebag Cop. Um, but Mulder goes into the building just to check on tombs, I guess, uh, and finds Scully's cross. So he knows i got to get my ass to Scully's house right now because she's clearly the, the, the next victim. You actually see Tombs stalking Scully and you get that, that moment where she's in the... or I did anyway, where she's in the bathroom, she starts the bath and I'm like, oh, they're going to just gratuitously just get her down there <laughs> and these wee again. You, you know, you're just thinking, here we go. <laughs> um, but they, they don't... They, they subvert that again. They, they don't go the, the route where you expect it to go or... I did expect it to go there. Yeah, well, well no, yeah. I, I did. I expected the same. Uh, like, they're playing on tropes, aren't they? They're, they're playing on mm-hmm. the tropes of... Every horror yeah, movie. every ever. horror movie. The woman, if the woman's going to the shower, she's the one who's going to be the next victim. Um, mm-hmm. But again, you know, Scully puts up a good fight. She's not just she's not just a, a, a scream queen. She's not a, a final girl, uh, as, as mm-hmm. they seem to be calling them these days in horror movies. <laughs> But just before that scene, actually, I just wanted to say I really love the moment when um, just after Colson has told Scully that he's he's called the stakeout off. I love how she says, "I can't wait until you fall off and land on your ass." She basically just that's it, final straw. Relationship's over. There's no, there's no friendship between these two anymore. That's it, um, and and that that's kind of the last we see of Colton. But I, I gotta say, I'd have liked to have seen this guy return, and he never does. Unfortunately, he never comes back into the X Files. Um, but I, I'd have liked to have seen a return of him. Maybe, maybe when he's climbed the ladder, um, it would have been interesting to see an episode in which actually he was now. Skull is superior um, because because he's you know he's done his career ladder climb and and how that would have affected the dynamic of their relationship. But no, that's it. That's the last we see of Colton. So one one can only assume that Scully was right and that he did fall on his ass when Scully's struggling with Tombs and Mulder comes in. You now these two have their suspicions about this guy. They know that he can kind of like do something with his body, and yet they still handcuff him. (laughs) Yeah. Was that the only one that's just like, come on, this this guy, if this guy really wanted to, he could get out of that in seconds, you'd imagine. Yeah, he could get out of that, but one, Mulder's got a gun on him, and no matter how stretchy he is, he's not impervious to bullets. Um, So I, I think the only thing that is keeping him there right now is the fact that Mulder's got a gun on him. Um, Mm -hmm. After that, the only thing that keeps him from escaping is the the burden of proof, really, is that Mulder, as as far as the rest of the FBI are concerned, Mulder's theory about this guy stretching is is just, well, that's typical Mulder for you. Um, You know, Scully, Scully can try and back it up with all the science she wants. Fact of the matter is, people don't believe it. Um, mm. So, and we pick up on this in the in the next episode. So when we come back to the to the the sequel, so to speak, uh, which was called mm-hmm. just called Tombs, we, we we do address this. I, I feel as if they they addressed ever so slightly when um, they've got Tombs in the psych ward, and there's a, a comment about him having some sort of abnormalities with his with his physicality. Yeah, they're basically saying that it's just some sort of weird mutation almost. It's just a evolutionary blimp or something mm-hmm. like that. You know, they, they don't they're not writing it off as something crazy like aliens or anything like that. They're just saying like, yeah, it's happened, it's an anomaly. Yeah. But then you've got Tombs sitting in his psych ward making his new nest, <laughs> which is just terrifying. Yeah, not not doing himself any favours really, is it? <laughs> no, no, he's he's, he's playing to the st- the crazy stereotype there. But just to be sitting there licking that newspaper is just horrible <laughs> and then he he gets his meal delivered and he sees that small opening mm. on the door and that just smile yeah. just stretches across his face and we have that last line of dialogue as well by Mulder which I mentioned earlier which is just about all these people putting bars on their windows and locks on their doors trying to make themselves feel safe 
um, and and it's not enough with this guy. It's mm-hmm. not enough, and I, I think at the time when this episode came out, that that was a kind of social commentary because I think that it was th- this period, I guess, around the early nineties that there was more of a move towards people actually bolting their doors and and barring up the windows and 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 maybe feeling a little bit too over the top with regards to security but Mm -hmm. okay you know people like tombs don't really exist in the world but to a certain extent Mulder's right you you can't you can't um buy yourself into safety you can't lock yourself away from the world in order to protect yourself um and that's Mm -hmm. really the theme of the episode i think yeah overall for me I really like Squeeze. I, th- I think it's one of the, the best episodes. That, like, it's stuck with me for 23 <laughs> years since I last saw the, the TV show. Um, I really like the whole horror aesthetic about it. I like the fact that it it, it carries some of those tropes, but some circum- circumvents them as well. Yeah. Like you said, Scully really gets a strong role in this, and Mulder gets to show his, his fun side. You know, he's just not caring. He's just after a result, a, an answer type of thing. He doesn't care what people think of him. Um, and quite easily, it's the, it's the best of the series so, or the season so far. And for me, it's a five out of five. Yeah, I, I just echo everything you said. As as an X Files fan, this you know this is this like I said, I I was there from the beginning. I I I've watched this series right from the pilot. I I liked those first two episodes, but it was Squeeze that kind of made me go, all right, I'm in. That's it. You know. I will come back to this series every week um, because this episode has got me. That's that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, a, an excellent first-rate Monster of the Week episode. An episode that really shows the strength of the character of Scully and Mulder to an extent, um, like particularly their relationship with each other. But, yeah, I think this is a strong Scully episode, even though it's not necessarily Scully-centric, um, but in many in many ways it kind of is. Uh, so yeah, really cracking episode. Five out of five for me as well. Yep. So we hope you enjoyed that episode as well, and we, will, I'm sure, we'll see you back for the next episode, which is Conduit. One that I can honestly say I, I don't remember a thing about. Tell me, Brian, is this one of the the, the, the more well known episodes? I I, mm, I think it, in many ways it's essential for, for as far as the first season goes, just because of certain things it deals with. Whether it deals with those things in the best possible way is, is something that I guess we will discuss next episode. Um, so, so, yeah, we'll look forward to that one. <laughs>